tonight, but Chris, people have rehearsals and stuff already booked because you know it's a big city. People have things already booked. <laughs> But uh, my my wife is playing next week as the feature act at eight o'clock, and I play every week at nine o'clock. She's going to play tonight at ten, uh, shorter set. Cool. Yeah, I don't know if I've ever heard of it. What's the place called? It's called the Mix. It used to be called B Side. So the owners of Remix Lounge on Dundas during COVID, they uh, not that COVID's over, but they uh, they purchased uh, they purchased the B Side and renamed it the Mix. They've uh, run a lot of different venues over uh, uh, spanning uh, several decades, going back into the 80s in Toronto. Oh, cool. I think it might be just down the street from me. I live on uh, Grayson College. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's right there. Cool. I'll have to check it out sometime. Yeah, come, by, wow. come by with political questions. We allow political rants as well, spoken word, uh, comedy, anything. It's a truly open stage. Awesome. Um, so yeah, on that note, I'll uh, get into it. And I was just hoping you've started doing a little bit, but could you introduce yourself a little bit and just tell us a bit more about yourself? And by us, I mean me. Uh, yeah, absolutely. My name's Adam Golding. I've lived in this ward for 20 years. Uh, I was born here in Mount Sinai Hospital. I grew up in Barrie because my father passed away uh, from lung cancer. He was a teacher at Don Mills Collegiate, uh, taught high school English. Um, and we was involved in education. He wanted to ultimately teach Oise. Uh, my mother was an artist. Uh, I was just passing through Barry and saw, found some of her artwork in a window. Um, she, I'm actually going to, I think I'll do an exhibition of a few of her paintings that I have soon. And uh, I, I um, studied composition uh, originally in high school and, and piano and went to U of T for music and branched out from there. I was also good at math in high school, so I went into that, did uh, math and philosophy, had a lot of questions. I was the first atheist in my Protestant family. My family took all of the possible off roots from Protestantism. My grandmother's sister married a Jewish man. Her eldest daughter married a Catholic OBP officer. The middle sister married into capitalism. And my mother married a teacher and became a hippie. And I gave birth to me the first atheist in the family. So, but these days I think I'm converting to polytheism because, you know, it's hard to say that I worship, worship Jesus more than Socrates or Socrates more than Jesus if I treat them both as historical dudes at any rate. <laughs> um, so, you know, I branched out uh, into philosophy as well for those kind of reasons. And uh, then ultimately also studied cognitive science and AI at U of T and got involved in student politics. I was a two term student president there, president there and, and organized events. As you can see, I organized a lot of events. That's been my bread and butter for years. Uh, organized a lot of events there for many years, discussion events, reading groups, uh, uh, helped uh, organize conferences, including one on cognitive science and economics, which was my first introduction really into the nitty gritty of that. And uh, it's good to go that way because behavioral economics makes more sense than normal economics. <laughs> and uh, and uh, in student politics, people would always ask me, oh, are you going to go into real politics? And I was kind of like, well, you know, I do kind of, I did kind of want to be a musician, uh, <laughs> which, you know, I was heavily trained in. So I did that. I became uh, you know, a regular performer and, uh, and uh, spent a lot of time focusing on music because I felt I'd uh, let my music uh, uh, development atrophy for a few years because I'm also easily addicted to intellectual political stuff. But, uh, and also I was recruited into the pirate party out of student politics, this guy, Sean Villiers, um, somehow found me online through all the stuff that I post and uh, said, hey, you know, you should know the Pirate Party. The Pirate Party technically no longer exists as a party, but uh, I'm still the Toronto strategy, strategy coordinator. And part of my strategy was to focus on research for a long time and to get involved in quote unquote normal politics. I ultimately started working for the NDP um, last year, but a lot of other stuff happened first. So actually I'm skipping over a bit, uh, but uh, well, I'll, I'll, John Tory happened. So there were dispensary raids uh, there were arguably authoritarian overreaches in COVID measures, and uh, there were these violent encampment evictions, which I was personally arrested and charged with obstructing the police. And so um, those charges have since been dropped, although not everyone's charges have been dropped yet. Um, and um, the, you know, the, the waste continues, the money that's being wasted on authoritarianism. And um, I, I joined uh, working for the NDP the year after, or I mean, in that, that sort of that year. Um, worked on the phone for the Jagmeet Singh campaign, the Andrew Horvath campaign, learned quite a lot, talked to every progressive I could. And uh, now I'm about to, I guess this week, start making a lot of phone calls and do door knocking. I'm a bit behind on that. So if anyone can help me canvas, I really need your help. And uh, we can go out there and find donors and voters. And um, I'm still working as a musician. Um, you can see me improvise live music uh, many nights a week. I have a song called Evict John Tory that we all need to learn before election day. I made the song to market the hashtag if you look up the hashtag on YouTube, you'll find a playlist of everything uh, that went wrong in terms of those mass evictions last year, including video of my own arrest. And um, yeah, that's a, that's about it. 
Um, how did you decide to run for council this year? Hmm. So, well, a lot of things happened. Um, I mean, I decided to get more involved in politics a few stages. I decided to, to quadruple basically my time studying politics when Donald Trump was elected, especially because the New York Times gave Hillary a 98% chance of victory. And then I decided to do as I knew I would at some point focus on municipal when John Tory sued Khalil Savright. And I said, well, that's, a, that's another obvious bug. I, I taught software development for a while as well. And I think of myself as trying to fix the bugs in the code that runs our society. We have unfair rules because we have buggy code. And this seemed like an obvious bug. Uh, why why sue a hero? It seems like political suicide and mean and wrong and, and you know, likely to result in more deaths, not fewer. And, um, you know, you, you can see in my launch speech, I, I talk with a lot more angrily. I'm, I'm, I've said it enough times that I can talk with this calmly now, but I couldn't always uh, because it was just so infuriating to see uh, my mayor, supposedly, on TV saying something that made such little sense. I mean, I used to teach uh, formal logic and he would say things that are um, uh, just so, so ambiguous as to be nonsense. Because um, he would say, oh, uh, a tiny shelter is not safe. Well, what is that supposed to mean, to say that a tiny shelter is not safe? Uh, it's, it's, you know, compared to his condo or compared to dying from exposure, right? Because those are very, very different comparisons. And he doesn't complete the sentence because he wants, it's basically a dog whistle in that he wants one person to complete the sentence one way, another person to complete the sentence a different way. So um, th that, that was really infuriating to me. And that was before... Um, uh, all of the, the mass evictions happened, the zero encampments motion. So, so I, I was right that things were awry and they got worse and worse from that point on. And so I, I had started paying very close attention at that point. Um, uh, working for the NDP, I knew uh, the municipal election was coming afterwards. So I figured I would learn what I could federally and provincially because I knew something was going wrong municipally. Uh, especially because we had a unanimous vote to take a human rights approach and did the opposite. So like even our voting is not working. Um, and as far as, you know, um, the options, I mean, I didn't really consider running for another ward. Some people did try to encourage me to run for uh, kind of Fort York because that was an open race when, when Cressy got out. Um, of course, Alice Mo was in before, um, uh, before the, the, the wards were, were uh, re-amalgamated. And, uh, but I, I wouldn't really consider being a parachute candidate. And as far as I can tell, uh, the people running against me are parachute candidates, at least in the sense that they don't live here right now. Um, maybe one or two have a history here. I'm not particularly aware of it for most of them. So um, there's no really real question of where I would run. And the timing right now is that a lot of people want to um, move in a more radical direction further left than the NDP. The NDP has been kind of captured by the neoliberal duopoly. You can see this satirized on the Twitter account called the NDP Neoliberal Caucus. So uh, we've co-founded this group called the Socialist Alliance, uh, which is uh, designed to bring these more radical policies. And the time is right for this because uh, every single person that I talk to says, we, we need something further to the left. We need, we need a, a real alternative. And uh, so some of us are actually doing it. And so we're going to have a, a slate of picks. And uh, so see what we choose on socialistalliance.ca. Yeah, I've, I've I uh, perused it a little bit before the interview just to see uh, what it was about. Sort right. of pulling more outward. So you live in University Rosedale. I also live in University Rosedale. So we both know it's a very big and diverse community. There's a bunch of like cultural milieus, neighborhoods, a lot of people. I was wondering if you had plans on how to like balance the diverse interests and needs of the people that live here. Since yeah, I mean, um... I mean, I suppose I, I, we, I could ask you if there's specific uh, tensions that you've observed, but in general terms, um, one, one thing that's come up already, just even in my conversations emailing Mike Layton over the past few years, is uh, as far as I can tell, we need neighborhood specific bylaws, because there's a lot of conflict, even just in terms of all the different people in the park. I go to the, the parks and the piano, uh, the, the pianos in the parks every day. I'm involved in those projects, putting uh, pianos in parks. Hope we're going to put one into Bellwoods in October. And... Um, and th those projects alone create a lot of conflict. Um, in fact, I discovered that I can create a conflict by playing piano because sometimes people want attention and so they'll have a fight with somebody just to get attention. W weird, unexpected consequences of things, right? Um, and uh, w one thing that came up a lot is like the hours and like the noise regulations. And I, you know, I run concerts and house parties, so I encounter this kind of thing a lot. And what, what I normally do with, with neighbors is we negotiate locally. We say, okay, what's gonna be the eight hour window? You know, it doesn't have to be what the city decides. But the thing is, the park is seemingly unable to do this. You, you, you would think like two neighbors don't require much organizational infrastructure to do this, but you need a bit more organization for, say, all the people who live around a park to vote on what the quiet hours are for that park. 
because what we have now is a cookie cutter thing where every park it's illegal well a bylaw violation to go in any park after midnight you may not have known that so you you don't have to confess here on the air but you you may be a filthy bylaw violator you may have been in the park after midnight i certainly have been in fact if you use a swear word in a park you you've you've broken municipal code 608 um you know uh, it's 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 or use any kind of amplified sound ever um it's also also a bylaw violation without a permit and uh you know these these are authoritarian uh arguably and definitely cookie cutter and so i think every neighborhood should have its own vote i think basically wherever you live you should say okay what are the what's the nearest park to you or the nearest three parks or whatever just just as the bird flies let's say or whatever you do the taxi guy metric just have some like what are your nearest parks and those are the parks where you have a say in what those park rules are if you don't care you don't have to show up or to the whatever but you know the people who care can have a vote and, and the people who have to live in a park should get more say because you know, uh, the federal government controls the printer, but we can locally give people more say directly because that's what money ultimately purchases is political say. Um, sometimes it represents a finite good, uh, which which is more like the gold standard, but we have, you know, modern monetary theory printing money just basically represents political will. And um, we, we can do that locally, even though we, it's more complicated to have a local currency, ask people locally what they want the rules to be. So that, that's an example when it comes to park rules. And I also think we should start giving some parks over to indigenous governance, but not all of them in test and compare. And I think we should start with Allen Gardens. I mean, that's not in my ward, but um, there's, there's a good uh, infrastructure there right now to support that kind of move, I think. Um, and so that's just make greater diversity of the rules. Because look at how diverse Toronto's neighborhoods are, like you say, even within University of Rosedale. You know, why, why should Chinatown have to have the same rules as Kensington Market? There's really no reason. Um, there's no good reason. There's just bad reasons. <laughs> so that that's that's that would be this that would be where I would start because once you have neighborhood specific bylaws, everything else becomes a local discussion. You don't have to route everything through the councilor. I think yeah, that's a, a really interesting proposition that I've actually never heard before. Um, but yeah, I thought I was bad for uh, drinking alcohol in the park, but turns out that uh, going there after midnight is. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah, drinking, you, you violate that one too. Although so does Councillor Brad Bradford. He admitted to drinking in the park in the same meeting where he voted to keep it illegal, which is just like the height of hypocrisy, at least in terms of like temporal proximity. And and he came up to me, I started tweeting at him being like, you know, you know, what's your problem? And he came up to me at a council meeting being like, why are you chirping me on Twitter? I was like, well, I just wouldn't vote for a bylaw that I break. Like it's hypocrisy. I don't get why that's confusing, you know, <laughs> surprising. <laughs> Yeah, um, the one tension that I did want to specifically sure. ask you about because you've experienced with housing need is I've noticed a lot of tension with like development and housing. So I was wondering, yeah, your stance on that, particularly the tension part. Hmm. Um, but by that, do you mean like like homeowners? What do you mean development? You don't mean you don't mean that. I mean like like. I mean, like housing development, like I mean, like owners in historical neighborhoods being like, mm -hmm. we don't want it to change. Okay. So, Just so one, one thing that I, that I've said before, um, I proposed this to Gil uh, the other uh, week when I was at his thing. And, and this, this came out of, of really uh, talking to people a lot during the provincial campaign. Um, what I, what I found is that the conservatives and the NDP actually have, as far as I can tell, complementary ideas about rent control that you could actually combine them, but the tribal political agencies prevent this simple mathematical operation from being done because one policy is marked as theirs and the other policy is marked as, as, as you know, the, the in-group or whatever, depending which side you're on. And so those policies are uh, Jessica Bell's Rent Stabilization Act, which involves real rent control where the rent stays the same between tenants and the conservative plan to remove rent control on new units to incentivize development of things. But I would say this should be generally on new gr new grounds. Um, they, they, they shouldn't just be, it shouldn't just be any new developments. It, it should be basically, we should be incentivizing Toronto to spread out um, and, and that will reduce uh, some of the density problems. So if, if you say, hey, you know, investor, you want to invest in Ontario, why don't you help us, help us uh, you know, develop something where you're not knocking down a heritage building, let's say, you know, why, why it's already built. Like, like if it falls down, sure, go ahead, you know, build something new. But, you know, I, I live by, if it ain't Baroque, don't fix it. Um, there's lots of need to build out in Ontario. And, you know, um, it's not to say we don't have to tackle the density problems, but the incentives of rent control shouldn't be giving you uh, rewards 
um, they should be giving you rewards specifically to doing developments that don't displace heritage buildings, because those heritage buildings will get the benefit of the other half of the rent control I'm proposing, which is uh, that they stay cheap because they're old buildings. So what we need is a mix of cheap and old and expensive and new. The expensive and new uh, can bring money into the city, um, but there's no reason to displace people. Um, one of the questionnaires, I forget which questionnaire it was that was sent around, but they said, like, do you support the idea that rent should never go up so fast that residents who grew up in a neighborhood have to move out of there? And I said, yeah, of course, people should never have to move out of the neighborhood they grew up in. Um, so, so the rent control has to be has to be structured that way. Old units have to stay at basically old prices, except for the general inflation. You, you have to do really serious renovations, and we have to regulate rent evictions a lot more than we do. And uh, new developments, um, the incentives for new developments uh, should be only on, on, on sites that don't involve demolishing perfectly functional buildings. Great. Yeah, uh, those were my questions. It was a short interview, but if there's anything I didn't mention that you want to say, go for it now. But otherwise, thanks for meeting with me. Well, you know what? I'm good. Let me open up a little file here. I'm going to take this opportunity to tell you something that hasn't been released yet. Oh, okay. Um, it is my arts platform. And it's, I, it was ironic that I had a platform and then arts vote asked me for an arts platform. And I realized I didn't have one, even though arts is where I came from. And it's because politics has been kind of a distraction, so to speak, for everyone. Uh, you know, like even when I was in student politics, um, the, the market crash in 2008 meant that enrollment was frozen in the program uh, for which I was the president of the student union for, for two years. And so, you know, we, we wanted to just be doing abstract studies, but it turns out the market reality affected our ability to just like, you know, as an entire department, not just individually, someone's ability to finance their studies, but the entire department had to freeze its enrollment because of the market crash. So it was like, boom, reality collides with, you know, the ivory tower. And uh, then, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be an artist in Toronto and reality would collide repeatedly, like my students would be too poor to continue their studies or they'd have housing problems or I would have housing problems or my friends would or, you know, other people I'm playing with. And uh, so, so reality keeps colliding with the arts. And then I was just focused on reality. And then they came around and asked me for an arts problem. I was like, OK, well, what is the reality of this? And I asked a bunch of people and I got a bunch of different ideas. So I'm just going to read out this is arts platform 0 0.1. So this will change, but I'm just going to read this stuff to you and um, if you have any questions, I'll pause on that point. So just feel free to interrupt me. Sounds good. Okay. Put basic needs first in the budget, which includes citizen free time to be creative. Uh, maintain a proper city calendar of all public events. Um, maintain a city database of public event spaces. Uh, fund artist residencies in parks and in more libraries. Uh, allow communal housing. That's actually great for artists. Um, uh, of rooming houses, uh, more city level arts grants. We've got some, they're hard to get and they're very slow, the turnaround time actually. Subsidize local arts education through community centers and private instruction, mentorships and apprenticeships. Ensure neighbor neighborhoods have sufficient space for dance and healthy movement. Uh, expand arts programs for low income children in schools, which have been slashed dramatically in recent years. Uh, and first come first serve for city programs introduce equity based priority, for example, single parents, et cetera, other equity deserving groups. Uh, a local music promotion subsidy, because promotion is a bottleneck for a lot of artists They often have a good product, but poor promotion. Um, uh, more all ages music spaces uh, and busking licenses. Uh, this is a quote from a voter. Uh, busking is part of the heartbeat of the city. And when I travel to other cities, that is one of my favorite joys. It being restricted here makes Toronto seem dead. <laughs> The <laughs> truth from truth from voters um, and, and eliminate the oppressive audition process for the TTC, which takes years. Be like Montreal, where you can just go in the subway and busk. Uh, no door cover on publicly funded events, uh, living wage, live music subsidy and tax. So that would be a tax free live music subsidy fee on each bill. The city and the citizen would both fund live music that way. You'd be the city and the person and the customer would both, both be sort of tipping the act. Um, fun public pianos, which I mentioned earlier, run into me at many of them. Uh, Kensington, Christie Pitts is 24 hours right now. Um, grants for homeowners to have their laneway garages painting, painted. Uh, limit public funding of large projects so more artists receive funding. Uh, so it's just like one big giant thing. And they're like, done, we spent all of our, our art money. We <laughs> on to the next meeting. <laughs> Drive tourism with local art. Uh, affordable 24 seven rehearsal spaces, music spaces. Um, grant event permits by default and publish justifications for all denials for the media to inspect. 
because it's just red tapes to the hilt. Uh, an open mic subsidy, uh, extra funds for venues which permit any citizen to, perf to perform, and uh, equity-based micro grants for ongoing costs, instrument maintenance, art supplies, rehearsal time, creative space, rental, um, and mere poverty Mere poverty is sufficient to qualify for these kind of equity-based micro grants. So these are all ideas that I've sourced from real artists working in Toronto and people that I just happen to know from being a performer. And uh, this group happened to ask me for an arts platform. And so within uh, three days, I put this together. And that's the kind of process that I will use as a council. I'll ask everyone what they think and get the bug fixes, not from rich donors, but just from talking to people about what's you know real ideas and you know what's really going on in you know, the real arts. That's really, yeah, that's a great platform. I'm excited for it to get to release because it's unique based on everybody else who's running. So I'm excited uh, for that's it to good get to I should put it out. I guess I should put it out tonight <laughs> damn i have more work to do okay 